Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon. It was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, a woman goes missing and a body is found. This was a classic example that she'd been strangled. Advances in science which lead to answers from tiny pieces of evidence left at the scene. The most successful result we had was from a sample from the outside of the chewing gum in this instance. And loved ones waiting decades for answers. I'll never forget her. That girl will always be in my life and always be in my heart. Gone but not forgotten. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. The local residents in the block of Masonettes first noticed a strong and unpleasant smell coming from a utilities cupboard owned by the council. The council were informed and workmen attended and jammed off the, uh, the padlock uh, off the door and it was then discovered that there was a body inside the cupboard, uh, covered with uh, blankets and paper. Tuesday, the 18th of August, 1981, Detective Inspector Roger Graham from West Midlands Police had been called to a shocking scene in the residential suburb of Ladywood, Birmingham. It was clear that the body lying under the stairs had been there for days. As is usual for such uh, um, incidents, there were uh, many uh, police cars of all types and an ambulance. And um, when I approached uh, the cupboard, I could see the dead, decomposed body. It had clearly been there for some days. It certainly was very, very suspicious, understandably, um, but with no sign of visible injury, and until a post-mortem had told us the cause of death, it, it, it would not have been wise to go off at a, a tangent, really, and to wait for substantial evidence as to how she died. The door to the right gave uh, gave the residents access to the masonettes which were above. The area around the masonette was cordoned off and a heavy police presence moved onto the site. The resident registered as living at the address was a 24-year-old mother of two, Nova Welsh. She had not been seen for a few weeks. 
Nova was last seen on the 26th of July. In the days that followed, uh, the milkman carried on delivering milk, for example, uh, until somebody left a note for the milkman saying, no more milk till further notice. Around the same time, uh, Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer were getting married. This was after Nova disappeared. And in the conversations that were going on about where Nova might be, there was even speculation that she'd gone down to London to watch the royal wedding and be part of those celebrations. As those closest to Nova grew more and more concerned, they eventually raised the alarm. Alan Crouch was a detective constable at the time. One of her closer neighbours, uh, a friend of hers, was becoming more and more concerned about the fact that Nova had not been seen. So on the 9th uh, of August, that neighbour reported Nova missing. That generated a response from the local police and two officers attended Nova's uh, uh, masonette to make inquiries. They found that the masonette was secure and I think had to force entry. And whilst in the premises, they found uh, that the fridge contained food that was going off. Um, there was a, a milk bottle on a worktop that also had gone off. And I think there was a, a skull can of lager that could be seen as well. But suffice to say, there was no trace of Nova or indeed anybody else in the masonette. Nova was popular and well known, so her disappearance had been noticed by many. She was working as a part-time cleaner and she appears to have had a pretty active social life. She was going to dances, um, she attended a wedding. She seems to have had plenty of friends, so it was very unusual. As police conducted interviews with Nova's neighbors, it transpired that two of them had heard something one night, although at the time, the noises had seemed insignificant. During the early hours of the 27th of July, i.e. just after midnight, two of Nova's neighbours were sitting up watching television when they heard the sound of footsteps going past their masonette door. And they considered that there were, or more than one person, uh, were uh, responsible for those footsteps. And uh, I think that they probably were uh, heading in the general direction of Nova's flat. Shortly afterwards, they heard further footsteps, but they were shuffling footsteps as though they were carrying something or dragging something along. The neighbors also heard doors being slammed and banged. Uh, and a little bit later, the main access door to the masonette was slammed shut. And shortly after again, a car was heard to drive off. The immediate priority now was to confirm that it was definitely Nova. But with an advanced stage of decomposition, even that proved challenging. It's vitally important that we get a positive identification so that we don't start talking about the wrong person who, who isn't deceased. Um, what normally happens, either a, a member of her family or a close friend would have been taken to the police mortuary and identified her uh, in the mortuary. A physical examination would not be possible and would not be desirable. You just couldn't do it. But there were items of jewellery with the body. They were shown to a close friend and identified as the jewellery that belonged to Nova Welsh. Beyond that, uh, we found that Nova uh, was a patient of a dentist in the Hansworth area, and we were able to access dental records and confirm that the dental records were uh, identical to those of the deceased. The forensic pathologist's positive identification of Nova was just one part of the jigsaw puzzle. Now detectives needed to know how she had died and who had left her under the stairs. 
the, the death was suspicious and unexplained and Nova's body was in the utility cupboard on the ground floor of the masonettes. The door to the utility cupboard had been shut and uh, what had happened was that when the lock was replaced, clearly by those that had put Nova into the cupboard, uh, the, the lock had been resealed using a piece of chewing gum. But I remember that um, along with the lock there were some splintered pieces of wood and I think a couple of screws as well. There is no way in this world that Nova could have actually uh, been able to, to, to self-lock herself in the cupboard. It appeared that whoever had put the body there had used that chewing gum uh, to fix the lock. In the absence of DNA profiling in the early 1980s, all detectives could do was safely store these items of evidence. But in order to build a case at the time, they first needed a cause of death from the post-mortem examination, and the findings of it confirmed their worst fears. I was present, as was the detective superintendent. The coroner for Birmingham, a very experienced and distinguished coroner, he pointed out to me a bone in the neck, which was fractured, and he said this was a classic example that she'd been strangled. In August 1981, police in the inner city area of Ladywood, Birmingham, were investigating the death of 24-year-old Nova Welsh. Nova had been strangled and her body left under communal stairs in a block of flats. Nova was a mother of two young children and had a close group of friends, one of whom was Claudette Francis. Nova was a bridesmaid at my wedding. She's somebody you, you would love because she was placid, nice to talk to. She listens to you and you listen to what she has to say. And that's how she was. I've, I've never seen a, a bad side to Nova. She's always been a nice person. And that's how I, that's how I still imagine she would be. My imagination of her coming in, sitting down. Can I have a cup of tea? Or can I have a soft drink? And we'd sit and we'd talk what women, what women do, what women talk about, you know. There was nothing about her that was argumentative. She was just one pleasant person to be with. And that's Nova. Claudette was one of the first of Nova's friends to be visited by detectives after her body had been found. One day the door knocked and there was a policeman at the door, asked me if I know Nova Welch, I said, yeah. He said, we found her body in a cupboard in Ladywood. My, my legs, my legs went to jelly. I couldn't eat, sleep for weeks. You just cannot get it out. You can't get it. You can't take it in. It can't sink in that she, somebody could do this to somebody. I can't understand nobody. Nobody said they didn't see anything. A life just gone like that. Nova did not deserve to go like that. She was a beautiful person, body and soul. Nova Welsh was born in Jamaica in 1957. She came to this country uh, at a fairly young age with her family and settled in the Birmingham area. 
She'd developed a relationship with a man we know as Osmond Bell. They set up home together and ultimately had two children, two boys, who at the time of her murder were two and four. The family lived in a part of Birmingham which was popular with the Afro-Caribbean community and where tensions with the police at the time were running high. Birmingham at the time was, um, as it probably is now, a fairly multicultural society. Uh, there was, certainly in the Hansworth and certainly parts of uh, the Ladywood and Windscreen areas, uh, quite a large Afro-Caribbean community, uh, also a Sikh community. And uh, when I cast my mind back to July and August of 1981, there was um, some significant unrest and disorder in, uh, in the Ladywood uh, uh, areas and indeed in surrounding areas. And those problems weren't exclusive to Birmingham and its suburbs that summer. There was a lot of racial tension at the time. Um, there'd been riots in Brixton in London in the April of that year. Um, then there'd been riots in July in 1981. And one of the reasons for those riots was institutional racism on the part of the police. Lots of people complaining about stop and search. Every single person involved in this case, witnesses, um, people who the police needed information from, was a, a Caribbean youth, either male or female, all Nova's friends, all the neighbours. And it was at the same time when there was a huge distrust by Caribbean youth of the police. So you can imagine that it was very difficult for them to actually get any information out of the people who they needed to talk to. But despite this backdrop of racial tension and mistrust of the police in the Ladywood community, someone did reach out to detectives regarding an item which had been sent to them while Nova was missing. On the 9th of August, a letter was received via the post by one of uh, Nova's neighbours. It was an anonymous letter, and the author of the letter stated that she and her boyfriend were outside of the masonettes on the ground floor and that they could see into Nova's window, masonette window, and they saw an event take place where Nova was pulled down. Now, I was always skeptical about that and remain skeptical because I don't see how it's possible from the ground floor to see into uh, one of Nova Welsh's windows, given that it was on, a, on an upper floor. And obviously that uh, intention was probably to point the finger away from the real perpetrator of the crime. The police did run whatever tests they had available at the time on this letter, but they weren't able to draw any conclusions from it as to the identity of the person who sent it. But the most important thing about this letter the most important thing they did with it was keep it. While continuing their forensics investigations, detectives also began questioning Nova's friends to build a picture of who she was and any potential suspects. They asked about her family life and relationship with her husband, Osmond Bell. The relationship was violent, uh, neighbours have reported a lot of arguments, uh, Nova's friends reported that she would tell them that, that he was violent, uh, he was jealous, he was possessive, he'd said uh, to somebody else, I think if she leaves me, I, I know what I'm going to have to do. She always said she were happy. We have talked one and two times about because I turned to her one day and I said, why don't you leave? But it's, it's not that easy. First of all, you, you need security. You need somewhere to go. So she couldn't just take her two boys and go. It was not simple. With so much known about the state of Nova's marriage, Belle quickly became the focus of the police investigation. 
this history of domestic violence with reports coming from more than one source. He was heavily suspected by the police. Bell was arrested and taken in for questioning. I actually arrested Bell uh, on suspicion of murder on the Saturday after the 18th of, of August. Uh, he was at uh, his place of employment, which was on the um, Ladywood and Hansworth boundary. He caused no trouble. He didn't uh, dispute uh, that we were taking him to, uh, to the police station. News of the arrest spread quickly and was reported in the local news. I said to my husband, it's him. Can't be nobody else, because I didn't know nobody else in her life. It was just her, two children, and him. So who else could it be? It's gotta be him. And that, that was what's in my head, and it never left my head. But the interviews of Belle weren't straightforward. Like in his witness statement, he was not making any admission of guilt. At some stage during the interviewing, Bell had uh, given a, um, an alibi, which was um, that he'd been with his father. The, the father was subsequently seen by some other officers, and he supported Bell's story. I, I was as sure as sure can be that he was a one and only prime suspect. But to prove their theory that Bell was involved in Nova's killing, detectives needed conclusive forensic evidence. Forensic opportunities, um, certainly in those days, were very limited. So there was no great opportunity to do anything uh, in a scientific way with any of the exhibits. So the senior officers that were involved in the running of the case uh, decided that um, that at that time there was uh, insufficient evidence to prefer a charge of murder against him. The case came to, um, sadly came to a, a halt. With no other suspects and no concrete evidence, Osman Bell was released and the Nova Welsh case went cold for 30 long years. That is until crucial forensic evidence would finally come to light. In August 1981, a young mother of two was found dead in a cupboard underneath stairs in a block of flats in Birmingham. Nova Welsh had been strangled. The prime suspect, her violent husband, Osmond Bell. But he had a strong alibi, and with no forensics linking him to the scene, he was released without charge, and the case went cold. 30 years later, that was about to change. In uh, November of uh, 2011, uh, I'd left the police service. I was no longer a serving officer, but I'd actually been re-employed as a member of police staff on a major crime review team. The aim is always to try and look at cases on a biannual basis. And uh, certainly uh, in 2011, it was decided that uh, the time was right to carry out a review of the murder of Nova Welsh. Alan knew that advances in forensic science might provide answers for the case, but first he had to assess what, if any, evidence still remained. Uh, myself and a colleague, um, we, uh, we made some inquiries and, and we uh, determined that there were two boxes of material from the original investigation that were held at secure storage, um, and um, we created uh, an inventory of all the items that were that were in the boxes, so we itemised everything. And what I found was that the anonymous letter and the envelope and the lock and the screws and the splinters of wood and the chewing gum on the lock were still with the case papers and exhibits. Nova's 
death and the review of the material that existed presented quite a lot of opportunity. The case was then brought to the attention of Detective Chief Superintendent Caroline Marsh. She took the decision to present it to the Crown Prosecution Service in 2013 to have it fully reopened. We found some exhibits that we could su submit for re-examination. A lot of the witnesses uh, were still alive and still local, actually. We, we had to you know, spend quite a number of months trying to find a lot of the key witnesses in this case. You need all of those different components, really, to be able to successfully reinvestigate a cold case. Um, and, and in this case, there was a lot of those things existed. There was a lot of opportunity, or that's what it looked like from the start. Of all the forensic sciences to have advanced in the last 30 years, DNA profiling was one of the most remarkable. Jane Rice was brought on to assess if it could be used on Nova's case. We can obtain a DNA profile um, from almost any biological material, such as uh, skin cells, blood, saliva, or semen. We can then compare it to uh, a DNA profile obtained from any individual's reference sample. And if those two DNA profiles match, then that individual, along with any other individual who shares that DNA profile, can be considered as a possible source of that biological material. Certainly prior to the 1990s, it wouldn't have been possible uh, or it would have been extremely unlikely to be able to get a result by any other forensic method. Of the few pieces of evidence remaining from the area under the stairs where Nova had been found, the most significant was the smallest. It was the piece of chewing gum which had been used to secure the lock to the cupboard which she had been left in. This particular chewing gum was a bit more challenging. It was very old, um, it was dried out, it was actually quite brittle, and it was quite dirty on the outside. In this instance, we tried a number of different ways of sampling. There were some loose crumbs of, of um, chewing gum which had flaked off, so we did try and extract DNA from those. We also took a sample from the outside of the chewing gum um, and attempted DNA profiling that. And we also uh, took a third sample from inside the chewing gum from within it. We cut sections off it with a scalpel blade and place those small sections directly into a tube with some uh, reagents. We then um, use those reagents to extract the DNA from that sample. The most successful result we had was from a sample from the outside of the chewing gum in this instance. Now the forensic team turned their attention to the anonymous letter which had been received by one of Nova's neighbours back in 1981, when she was still missing and prior to her body being found. With an item like um, an envelope, we are aware it would have been handled um, perhaps during its manufacture, um, it would be handled perhaps in the shop or the post office where it was sold. Um, it, it may have been handled by other individuals in the household um, before it was taken um, and sealed down. Quite importantly, when Nova's friend had received the, the letter, which I, I should say actually was an anonymous letter, she'd opened the letter by cutting along the top edge of the envelope. So the majority of the, the lick seal on the envelope was undisturbed and preserved. So that presented us with an opportunity then around, could we perhaps obtain a DNA profile from the saliva that would have contributed to sticking that lick seal down? The process that we undertake is we very, very carefully peel back the envelope flap to expose the areas that were previously sealed under the flap. We then take um, a cotton swab, it's a bit like a, a cut, cotton wool bud. We moisten that with, with water and then we rub it gently against the surface. And what that does is remove any cells, um, DNA cells, so that could be skin cells or saliva cells that are present. 
and we then take that swab and we cut the swab head off into a tube with some, some chemicals and then we extract the DNA from those, those cells that have been transferred onto the swab head. Now, Jane and her team needed to know if they could match the findings of the envelope to anything found at the 1981 crime scene. With the envelope flap, we obtained not a full DNA profile, but a, a partial DNA profile in that we didn't have test results at all the areas of the DNA that we looked at. However, those areas that corresponded between the result from the chewing gum and the result from the envelope flap did indeed match. And what that indicated to us is the DNA on the envelope flap and the DNA on the chewing gum originated from the same individual. The really important thing to do was to try and identify whose profile that was. Now, the obvious thing to do is to just submit that to the DNA database and hope that you get a hit. But in this case, we submitted the profile to the database and we got no hit. So whoever's profile that was, they were not on the police systems. With no match on the national database, DCS Caroline Marsh and her team looked again at the suspects from the initial inquiry back in 1981. In particular, Nova's husband, Osmond Bell. They needed to know if it was his DNA on the items found, but how to obtain it wasn't straightforward. There was a couple of things we could do. So we could just go out and arrest Osmond Bell for the murder of Nova again, and bring him in for interview, and then take that sample of DNA and submit it to the laboratories. We could have gone out if we didn't feel we had enough to go and arrest him. We could have gone to see him and asked him for a voluntary sample of DNA, which of course he could have refused. If we went out and arrested him and brought him in and said, we've arrested you, re-arrested you for the, the murder of Nova and we take his DNA profile, it's, there, there is, it's very, a very straightforward line of inquiry that we'll re-interview him He'll probably either go no comment or he will say exactly what he said in 1981 and we don't really get much further. If we knew that that profile already matched, at the point that we go into an interview with him, we've got the trump card because we can ch start to challenge him around, well, actually, how has your DNA got into some chewing gum behind a lock on a cupboard where Nova's been found deceased? It gives us some additional opportunity. But we also had a concern in this case that somebody else had assisted Osman Bell. We decided that we wanted to know in advance of any arrest whether um, Osman Bell's profile matched. So we um, took about a piece of work of doing what we would call a covert recovery of his DNA. That covert operation, undertaken in 2013, led detectives to obtaining a discarded cigarette, which Osman Bell had smoked. It was then sent to the laboratory for forensic analysis. Would this finally link Bell to Nova's death? We were able to take that cigarette butt, um, recover cells from the section of the cigarette that would go into somebody's mouth, maybe in contact with their lips, and we were able to recover traces of DNA and determine a DNA profile that acted as a surrogate reference sample for Osman Bell. We compared that surrogate reference sample from the cigarette butt from Osman Bell to the DNA results that we had obtained from the envelope flap and from the chewing gum, and those profiles matched. In late 2013, police in Birmingham were reinvestigating the killing of 24-year-old Nova Welsh back in 1981. Nova had been strangled, and the killer remained at large for over 30 years. But now, through covert recovery of a cigarette butt, detectives had obtained a match between DNA found at the crime scene 
with that of Nova's husband, Osman Bell. We sent officers from the homicide team round um, fairly early one morning and just arrested him at his home address. He didn't at any point say, I'm not responsible for the murder of Nova Welsh. He was extremely subdued, he um, took legal advice, he went no comment in the interview, and he didn't protest at all around the, the police procedures. The DNA match um, between the saliva on the letter and Osmond Bell was one in a quarter million. And they said the DNA match between the DNA on the chewing gum and Osmond Bell was one in a billion. It was a, a high-tech breakthrough that they'd had. In 2016, over 30 years since Nova Welsh had been killed, West Midlands police finally had enough evidence to charge Osmond Bell with the killing of his wife. Some of Nova's friends were asked to give evidence in court and took the brave step of speaking up for her after all this time. about was that she said Nova had told her that Osmond was always hitting her. Those were the words she used. And Osmond Bell's barrister And for the new inquiry team, that this uh, had resulted in a successful con uh, conviction. Without forensic science and the diligence of detectives in 1981, who retained the vital evidence from the scene, Nova's case would have remained unsolved and her killer free. So what was remarkable about this case is that we were able to look at an old case that had remained unsolved and apply new forensic techniques, new DNA technologies, and obtain DNA profiles um, from very old and very degraded DNA material. If we hadn't managed to find the, the door lock, and the chewing gum and the letter, 
if we hadn't, if, if they'd been disposed of years ago, as sometimes happens on, on old, particularly 30-year-old cases, we wouldn't have been able to do the reinvestigation and we certainly wouldn't have been able to identify Osman Bell as, as the main suspect and then convict him of, of Nova's manslaughter. Some elements of the case remain unsolved to this day and some questions unanswered. There was things that really didn't settle very well with me that didn't quite fit and, and one of those things was people who are deceased their bodies are a lot heavier and it just didn't settle very well with me that Osman Bell who was really quite a slight individual would have been able to pick up Nova's body and carry her three flights down dogleg stairs and then get her into the very back corner of the store cupboard whilst also breaking the door, which you had to do to get in, because it was a locked door that only the council had keys to. So it still remains an unanswered question. We've never been able to resolve that, but I honestly believed that somebody else, I still do believe, helped move Nova's body from the flat down to the store cupboard. But the greatest unanswered question of all remains why Nova's life, and that of all victims of domestic violence, was taken. When we first became aware of this story, it was a story about DNA technology. The advances in science that had enabled the police to match DNA from some chewing gum, DNA from an envelope, with their prime suspect. But when you take all that away, what this is, is a case of domestic violence. Women are killed by their partners in this country at a rate of about two a week. These are, in a sense, the most cowardly murders because they are always a betrayal of the worst kind. It's a romantic partner, it's a family member taking somebody's life in the place where they should be the safest, which is their home. And to me that makes it much more important that the police should do everything they can to find and bring these men to justice even if it takes three decades. I just can't understand why you love someone, you've been with someone, you have, you have two children with someone, and you turn around and take your life. Why? What, what was the reason? Why has she, what she could have done you that bad? that you couldn't say, leave. You go your way and I'll go mine. Can't give her a life back now, can you? Because she's gone. Not there anymore. A friendship, a beautiful face. As you do miss her. You'll never, you, you, I'll never forget her, never. That girl will always be in my life. And all has been my heart. Gone but not forgotten. And that's how I see her.